Surprise recording attack! Oh my god, it's chapter 17, The Big Stick. The river sticks glimmered in the light of the gems, a velvet stream of shadow and blackness. It beckoned me forward, filling me with the burning desire of a sultry-eyed bedmate, and the desperate need of a weeping child. Huh. I was helpless to resist, staggering step by step to the rocky shelf. A familiar figure walked alongside on four legs, as if never injured. Ginger's form flickered for an instant before becoming as white as snow, her eyes the color of glacier ice. Then she was back, in her all-fiery glory. I felt myself inexplicably shift as well. Long, shaggy fur shortened into a thick but dense coat of black and molten brown. Mottled. Um, my paws adopted a greenish, oily tinge. I felt something around my neck. A collar, studded with gems. The feeling was almost gone as soon as it came. As one, we approached the dread river, solemnly pausing at the... <laughs> at the edge before dipping our heads down to almost within an inch of the frothy shadows. We risk much by this, I felt myself say, an undamaged throat rumbly, thi rumbling thickly with coarse words. But we can gain so much more, Ginger flickered. Flickered ghostly white once again when she said this, also in a different voice, one with pride, nobility, and conviction. You heard what she said. We can usher in a golden age of peace, brother. That is a small price to pay for that. This is a small price to pay for that. Different value for things we have, I reminded her. But peace is still up there. Oh, I think this is um, the leader guy and the mayor guy. But peace is still up there. We can do this. I know we can. Just look at what we've accomplished. An alpha, tried and tested, and a mayor a wielder of the elements themselves. Let's see what we can do as brothers. The burden. Too great, it might be. Ginger shook her head. For what we've been shown? Nothing is too great for that. For the greater good of all. I closed my eyes. The scent of corruption and the sticks flooded all my senses. I could even see it if I focused hard enough. But the promise of what she offered was too great to ignore. This would be the easy part, anyway. We've done much to come here. After old Yellowfang had been bested, things had really picked up. We'd moved fast and swooped into the power vacuum like a pair of vultures. Now there was only one last thing to do, and it would all work out. I spoke the words she had taught me. Ginger and I alternated verses, as was required. The words cut through the silence. We cursed prison like a molten blade of iron. On the light we march. From the blackness we strive. Unto our last breath. The dark shall survive. Break down the wall. Twixt wrong and right, we cast our ways aside in this sacred, eternal light. The visage of our tutor, our guide, who promised us so much, uh-oh, who had gathered us power, appeared in the reflection of the water, standing tall between Ginger and I, as dark and ethereal as the river sticks. She smiled, revealing sharp, serrated teeth. The next verse, the final one, was spoken with three voices, although only two bodies stood by the edge. For without shadow, there can be no light. As one, we dipped our head and drank deeply. Then the pain started all over again. Yes. My eyes flew open in a panic, taking in the sunlit room in an instant. Something was stabbing me, uh, my side hot, sharp, and blinding. I quickly rolled to the right, straight into the wall. Wump. How? Good thing I stopped myself with my face. This thing has been inserting intercepting dodgeballs, slaps of angry woman, and the wrath of Grandma's kissy face for years. Glad to see I hasn't lost its touch. But what was causing me so much pain? I rolled over to find the spearhead. It must have fallen out of my toga when I wrapped it around myself like a blanket. I absently pickled it, uh, picked it up between two fingers. I hadn't had much time to examine it before, and the darkness and frenzied atmosphere of the caves didn't help either. The head was shaped like a, a very... A very long, narrow leaf, thick and wide near the bottom, leading to a thin and elegant spire that looked sharp enough to split atoms. It was made of pale material, and looked to be some strange fusion of metal and crystal, a new element found only in Equestria, perhaps. Delicate, swirling designs running along a double blood channel along the blade spine gave it an aesthetically... Uh, Appealing appearance. I don't know that word. It's got A-E in it. A-E-S-T-H. 
But for all it was, it was still just a spearhead. I distastefully flicked the thing to the side as it embedded itself in the floor. Funny how the nature of killing things hadn't really differed in Equestria. When you think about it, it all comes down to poking holes in something until it dies. Be it from claws, or teeth, or arrows, or spears, or bullets. I shook myself out of my thoughts. For the first time taking in my room, I was lying half on, half off my cot. The few thin blankets I had were shredded to pieces. The mattress had been savaged, and the single pillow I'd been allotted was nothing more than a scattering of feathers. I breathed deeply, trying to regain my cool. Sitting up, and placing my head between my paws, I slowly rocked back and forth on the ruins of my bedding. The dream came back to me in waves, in surges of memory. What had I just witnessed? A loud knocking on the door shattered the stillness of the morning. Echo! barked a gruff, familiar voice. You all right in there? I heard some strange noises. I whistled twice in reply, my usual response to indicate that all was well. Brushing away some of the debris, I tried to put on an air of calmness, although I was still shaking inside from having to drink from the sticks again, even if it was just a dream. The door opened and revealed Captain Titus's golden form. He surveyed the room in stoic silence. Then he spoke. What in Equestria happened here? A nightmare? I offered him, sheepishly trying to swipe drifting feathers out of, out of the air. I'm not entirely sure. Typhus just, just sighed, appraising my destroyed sleeping comforts with a dark look. He wasn't wearing his battered silver armor today. Instead, a single blue sash was wrapped around one soldier and across his chest, decorated with a plethora of medals and ribbons. His steely, experienced eyes um, flickered to the spearhead sticking out of the floor. Is that what I think it is? he asked. Oh, Cracker Jacks. That stupid law the mayor passed. I wasn't supposed to have any weapons. And a spearhead counts as a weapon. You can still stab people with it. It's more or less the equivalent of an equestrian prison shank. The captain's golden telekinetic aura surrounded the weapon piece, then flickered out. He frowned and simply bent down to tear it out of the ground with his mouth. He spat it out to his hoof and moved it closer to his face. He curiously observed it, um, with the practice gaze of a veteran. His face never changed from that neutral, stony expression worn by the Royal Guard. Finally, he lowered the spearhead. See me in my office after breakfast. You're on meal duty, by the way. I suggest you step on it. We've got a lot more mouths to, speed, to feed, in case you haven't noticed. With that, he turned on the spot and swiftly trotted away, tucking the item in the, his sash. I let out the lungful of air I realized I'd been holding. Oh, well, fuck. Meanwhile, while Jin, when Ginger awoke, it took her a moment to realize that she was in the infirmary. She struggled to sit up, finding that her forelimb was immobilized. It was stuck to one of those tubes she'd been seeing the new, the new incoming medics unpacking the night before, attached to the small railing on the side of her bed. The tube was filled with some kind of magic restorative liquid, apparently. With a sigh, the mare flopped back down. She savored the sensation of the hot mattress. The infirmary always had the best places to sleep. She'd had a dream, but it was fading already. Something about Tartarus? Yes, and the sticks. That awful burning in her gut when she drank it. Not something I'd ever like to do again, she shuddered at the thought. Hmm. They had the same dream. The sunlight from the windows warmed her eyelids. Stupid sun. Why couldn't it come up five minutes later for once? She rolled over and was abruptly seared in the face by something... Um, hot and bright. Ginger hissed and raised her hoof to cover her eyes, wincing away from the glare. Once she was sure whatever it was had stopped shining, she peeked her eyes open a crack. They slammed wide open in shock, her heart suddenly thumping into her ribcage almost painfully. Now this was something she never thought to see again. Resting on the bedside table were her mother's goggles. The sun was reflecting off the, off the black lenses. That must have been what flashed her so brightly. Frowning, Ginger dug within the recesses of her mind, prying open the familiar mental barrier, sealing off her power. The goggles were surrounded by her soft green aura, and gently levitated over to hang in a space in front of her. It had been a long time since she'd seen these. She bit back a wave of sadness and nostalgia. But even then, she couldn't resist a small smile. They were welding goggles, of all things. Her mother had been an artist. <laughs> Not just any artist, but one who made beautiful sculptures of metals and gems. Oh. Too bad that's what diamond dogs eat. Her creations had been fantastical pieces. 
Some had even found their way into the places of a few of the royal family. The materials she'd worked with had required that she... Hmm... That she had to use powerful fires to melt the stuff down so she could shape it, coyly teasing it into the most wondrous kinds of shapes. The goggles let her see the metals better, often no more than shining globs of molten slag. She was some kind of mare, all right. Ginger remembered wanting to be like her once, shaping beauty from the ugliest piece of pieces of earth. That was before her own magic had come in, before she'd taken after her father's line, the snaps. They, the very forces of nature bent to their will. Both parents had been particularly skilled in magic indeed, but with her mother's line came prestige, as well as the gift of unicorn magic. Her relatives even had some distant claim to the royal house, apparently. But where had they come from? Ginger examined the eyewear from every angle. Last they'd seen them, they'd been gathering dust at, in her mother's abandoned studio at home. A sudden rumbling breath told uh, to her left told her the answer. Her father lay sprawled on a nearby sofa. Well, shit. He looked exhausted, and judging by the red in his eyes as he slowly opened them, probably still wasn't sleeping at night. The nightmares must be coming back. Oh, God. No. Her father immediately sprang to his hooves once she realized she was awake. Ginger's breath hitched in her throat as he approached the bedside. Frost looked at her leg for a few seconds, then right into her eyes. Ginger swallowed. I knew this would happen, he stated. Ginger said nothing. I told you this would happen, and you ignored me. Now look, trapped in a hospital like some elderly cripple, he spat. I got hurt. This happens to every pony, Ginger weakly stated. Not to you, he fired back, rounding on her. You can't get hurt. Too important. Yes, that's it. Frost was pacing now. I'll file a petition to that weak excuse for a captain. You're too valuable to serve. You need to be safe with the real citizens. The ones who'll stay by us, who won't run off to the first overblown t fop. Fop? From Cantalot, who says he's here to help. No, Ginger protested instinctively, without thinking. How could he do this to her? She was helping the town. They needed her for the to plan her the work. He stopped pacing, staring directly ahead. What did you say? No. Her courage was being smothered. Come again? Silence. That's what I thought you said. I know what's good for you, Ginger. The town guard is no place for you. You could be seriously hurt. Or worse. I can't stay by you all day. I have too much work ahead of me. You don't have to do that. I'm fine on my own. Obviously considered that blasted idiot sends you on one mission and you come back with a hobble worse than a paraplegic that shut her up again when the town takes residence in the airship tonight i want you in there with them it's going to be far too dangerous for you frost paused as if thinking deeply about something as your parent i have a right to ensure your safety i want you away from those traitors in the guard and away from the damned hydras something flickered in ginger that rebellious spirit she'd always carried before she could stop herself, it ignited into a small flame. And him? she asked. Frost winced, as if physically struck. His anger abounded with a surge. Don't you even dare mention that thing's presence around me! It's an affront to everything I've worked for, everything I've done for you and this town! Why? Ginger responded quietly. The fire would not go out without a fight, it seemed. Why? Why? Look what you've got in front of you! That's why! Look at where you are, and why your... Oh, wait, no, this is him. Look at where you are, and why your leg needs to be in that contraption in the first place. It's here because I saved the lives of some twenty ponies who were outside of the wall when a hydra was sighted. Ginger struggled upwards. The fire grew. A hydra that was sighted by me, and if I hadn't, we'd be twenty more bodies for the graveyard. And if it wasn't for him, there would have been twenty-one bodies as well. Frost's eyes blazed. He opened his mouth. But Ginger cut him off. She raised herself even higher. The metal container binding her leg to the bed creaked in protest. The scent of smoke tinged the air. Actually, in a way, there would be twenty-two bodies, because he saved my life twice in the same day. We followed your tunnel, father. The one you and Mosspaw dug. How dare you say that name in front of me! He shouted furiously. How dare you not tell anyone that you broke into Tataris for Luna's sake! She roared right back. 
Her leg was now awkwardly twisted. The liquid inside the container was actually boiling, and as she <laughs> raised herself up yet again, the attachments to the bedpost began to warp. How dare you not tell me! Your own daughter! She exhaled sharply, emitting a, sol a small cloud of steam from her nostrils. I went through hell for this town, literally, and so did he, so did you, and so did Maspa. The that was different, her father managed to choke out. We had another per- No, it was not, Ginger screeched, magic amplifying her voice to painful levels. The mattress underneath her abruptly caught fire. The mare winced and grunted, finally tearing three from the bedpost. She twisted off the bed and broke the container with a burst of magic, extinguishing the blaze in an instant. She shakily stood up and rounded on her father, finally regaining her temper. Why did you come here? she said flatly. Frost levitated the goggles over to her from the smoking mattress. To remind you. His voice had become cold and emotionless again, as usual. To remind you of what we lost. I can't go through that again. What you lost? Ginger spat. I'm beginning to think I lost two parents in those caves. Her father bowed his head, eyes closed. And I think I've lost a daughter, as well as a wife. Ho! Oh. Ginger recoiled. What right did he have to say that? She'd looked after him for eighty years. Eight, <laughs> for eight years. In the beginning, he'd been too depressed to even use the bathroom correctly. She'd raised him back from the brink. More or less, she'd been the mayor of Wet Hoof while her father fought off his demons. He'd conquered them. Or, so she thought. Whatever you're after, whatever you're planning, I want no part of it. Keep me out of your damned scheming. Without another word, Ginger slipped her mother's goggles around her neck and stormed past him, only limping a little. He didn't move an inch. For a split second, his form flickered, filling out and straightening up. Then it was gone. She gave one backwards glance, then burst through the infirmary door into the main hall of the barracks. Buck the consequences! She had a town to stave! And once the danger was past, she was leaving. This time, for good. Meanwhile... Coming in high, Coconut called. I stretched my arm up as I leaned back over the counter, catching the flapjack nearly neatly on the tray. I grunted in satisfaction, setting the tray down on the second cart of the morning. As I set to work on filling a bin with sliced fruit, I had a few seconds to spare, and glanced around the madhouse surrounding us. To put it bluntly, the kitchen was getting more action than a prostitute in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. <laughs> okay. And business was booming, baby! In the sense of activity, I mean. Not from getting plowed by a bunch of drunk, drunk guys. <laughs> the reinforcements had some cooks of their own. Big, swarthy ponies like Coconut, who cursed and joked and laughed uproariously. One of them was the burialiest mare I'd ever seen. They were holding their own against our two-man tag team, but just barely. See, when I'd first come into the kitchen, they'd have been astonished that a diamond dog would have any interest in the culinary arts. When Coconut had tried to vouch for me, they hadn't bought it, and so a good, natural-natured competition had erupted. Four C's, as the new guys were being called, versus the Hayseeds. Whoever made the most grub before breakfast, bell rang one. The prize hadn't exactly been worked out, but still. We were pumping out food like nobody's business. World hunger a problem? Pitch, please! Screw the Ghostbusters! Give us a call! <laughs> I tossed the entire cutting board, full of fruit in the, the air, and did a quick double swipe with my claws. The fruit fell back down onto the board, perfectly sliced, oozing juices. I slammed the counter, and it all gracefully arched through the air to fall in the near nearby bin. Oh. I swatted the thing off the counter with a neat backhand. It landed directly on the edge of the cart taking up the least amount of space possible, as the rest of it was already covered in their mounds of food. Cart number two, Forces. What you gonna do? Coconut sang, as he cackled and flipped the shit out of some more pancakes. <laughs> the fact that he was doing this all without the use of thumbs made it even more impressive. The brown stallion was a whirlwind of activity, completely in his element in the chaos of a full kitchen. However, the other cooks were blistering along as well. Cooking-related cutie marks... <clears throat> sorry. I mean, emblems, of their own on their flanks. It was going to be close. We'll fill another one up. Number two's good to go. Hup! The mayor called, sliding a rival platter of sliced fruit onto their own tray. 
It had one of those little umbrellas on it. These guys meant business. Hup, hup. Hup, ho! The other two answered. Echo, get on those buck and rolls. Move that furry flank, Coconut barked. This guy was almost as bad as Tithus in the kitchen. I swear. I skidded over to an the oven and popped it open. Every single rack was loaded with a tray of fresh cinnamon rolls. I extended my claws and gingerly gripped two at a time. The oven mitts the ponies used simply wouldn't fit me, so I had to be careful. Sliding all the trays onto the now clean, cleared counter, I hastily whirled around. Where was it? Aha! The frost was balanced on the end of Coconut's tail, held out for me. Forgetting something? He said, not even bothering to take his eyes off the flapjacks, which he was still furiously flipping at a demon's pace. I snagged the container and spun back around. The Forcey's third cart was filling up fast. We were falling behind. Thinking quickly, I lumped all the rolls together into one big tray. Looking over the innocent food, I raised the container of frosting high up, smiling evilly. Time to get sticky. One of the other chefs glanced around, spotting me with an upraised frosting. His eyes widened. Everybody get down! She's gonna blow! He ducked down. The others whirled about me, saw me, and did the exact same thing. Coconut's voice broke through the din of the kitchen. Echo, wait! I slammed my paws together as hard as I could, crushing the container flatter than a, uh, flatter than a coin between my furry mitts. Kabloosh! It exploded. So, please elaborate to me how the entire kitchen ended up covered in... Tithus, the only clean one present, paused and wiped a hoof on Coconut's nose before licking off a bit of the substance that covered it and frowning for a moment. In frosting? Four hooves equally coated in the same sweet, sticky goop pointed at me. I, meanwhile, was busy giving myself a bath. With my tongue. Because I was fucking delicious! Yeah! I looked up from my trying to lick the underside of my arm. I can explain. I swear. Tithus cocked an eyebrow. Never mind. Maybe I can explain. Five hooves met five faces. <laughs> All five faces were then promptly covered in five coats of frosting. Tithus, who had been formerly clean, clean, stared at his hoof in shock. He'd nearly done that on reflex. Uh-oh. Or clearly. <laughs> he, he roared with laughter. We nervously joined in until we were actually rolling on the ground in hysterics. What would that be like? Because his throat is all hurt, so he's like, just shaking. <laughs> After the fit passed, Tithus wiped off the frosting, um, giving the kitchen a ruined glance. Well, at least you got the food out to every pony. Feeding an army is no small task, he sighed and shook his head. Get yourselves cleaned up. I'll have some of the other forces come by and mop the place up. Echo, see me in my office when you're done. We gratefully headed off to the communal showers. You'd think that one would get weirded out by showering with a bunch of talkative guys and one burly chick at the same time. Surprisingly, I felt no shame. There was really no reason to have separate shower rooms anyway. We were pretty much always naked as it was. Letting it all hang out, is how the phrase goes. Or so I believe. <laughs> I turned the water on as hot as I would. As it would go, I alternately switched the, from washing the frosting out uh, the scorching jet to my tongue. That frosting was just too damn good to waste. So, mate, what do you think Cap wants with it? Coconut asked me from the nozzle next to me. Don't know. I paused to rub my face, clearing out some water that had fallen in my eyes. You know how we came back to town through the caves, right? Yeah. When we were down there, I found a spear. Brought it back with me, but the haft broke. He found the head in, in my room this morning. Really? I'm sure it won't be anything bad then. If you're worrying about the, that law, that Frosty put on a while back, you noticed that griffin swaggering around the Forcey camp? The one with the sword that's bigger than you? We broke some of his stuff last night by accident. He nodded, lathering some soap through his mohawk. That's him. See, from what I've been hearing, he's the head of a mercenary group. Our group that Frosty hired himself. If he tries to take your weapon away, he has to disarm his own mercs. Well, he could just change it for specifically diamond dogs or something, but whatever. Why would the mayor hire mercenaries when we are supposed to get an entire army at our backs? Coconut shrugged. Dunno, mate. Maybe he thought forces wouldn't be enough. Glad they're on our side, though. I had to agree with that.
A few more minutes passed. By this time, I was clean enough, but I was enjoying the water too much to get out. A question suddenly popped into my head. So, what's with that big airship floating above the barracks? The massive vehicle was impossible to miss. Even from inside the barracks, you could tell it was there. It cast a large um, shadow, enough to cover the entire building, and then some. Coconut looked at me quizzically for a moment. How do you not know about the airships, mate? It was my turn to shrug. Not from around here, remember? One of the other chefs in the shower, the burly mayor, a answered my question. We use them for transport and weapons when the terrain is too rough or the distance too great for a Pegasi caravan. Usually the flyers will pull us around Equestria whenever we're needed, but we use carriers like the Benevolent Mercy to go f to far places like Wet Hoof. It's a long way from Canterlot, um, dog. I did, uh, I digested that information for a while. It made a lot of sense to have an Equestrian version of an aircraft carrier. They could go far away and bring lots of troops. And these floated! How cool is that? I was incredibly intrigued by the technological implications of this. What fuel did they use? How did they float? What were they built like? Something she said stuck out, though. You said something about weapons? She grinned. You got it. She's packing heavy cannon, the good stuff. She'll be part of tonight's battle, actually. The Benevolent is gonna be up with your hayseed catapults, raining all sorts of pain down on the hydras. Seriously? I thought they called it the Benevolent Mercy. Uh, they called it the Benevolent Mercy and outfitted the thing with guns? I smell the black humor of Princess Celestia afoot. <laughs> Coconut spoke up. Hold up. I thought the town folk were going to be up there. If the Hydras break through, they'll be trapped inside the walls. Nope. We've got two more airships coming in for that. Every carrier has at least a few following them around. They should be here any minute, actually. We'll be keeping the big guns where they're need. <sighs> oh. Oh. Where they're needed, though. The front lines could use them. While Coconut continued discussing tactics with the mayor, I made my departure, politely saying goodbye to the rest of the chefs, who sent me off cheerily enough. In what seemed like no time at all, I found myself standing outside Tithus's door, freshly cleaned and wearing my toga, along with my armor, which I'd figured I'd have to keep wearing to get used to it. The plating still bothered me, though. Its weight was uncomfortable, and it only served to remind me that I wore because I was risking terrible injury. All in a day's work, right? Christ, I hate my job. I knocked on the door as softly as I could. Maybe if I pretended he wasn't home, I could just leave. The FedEx guys did it all the time. Stealthy bastards. <laughs> I can hear you out there. Come in. Hi, caramba. Forget that ponies have better hearing than humans. I opened the door and stepped inside, lowering my hood as a sign of respect. The office hadn't changed very much since the last time I'd been in there. The desk! Oh. Oh. Cot and Mannequin were in the same place as last time, although the Mannequin was currently wearing Tithus's beat-up regalia. The captain himself was sitting behind his desk at his chair. The bottom of all furniture pieces made for sitting were larger than those you would find on Earth. It allowed the ponies a place to sit as they would on the ground, but higher. Tithus was idly spinning the spearhead around by its point with its hooves. It had burrowed a small print prick into his desk, but he didn't seem to care. As I walked in, he glanced up and stopped, setting the fragment down flat. As there was nowhere else to sit in the room, aside from the cot, I simply stood before the desk. It looked kind of ridiculous from my height, like a child's plaything. Titus began to speak. Never in all my years did I think I'd have to see anything like this. He held up the spearhead. It glittered weirdly in the sunlight, streaming in from one single window. Do you know what this is made of, Echo? I shook my head. I honestly had no idea. It looked to be metal, but it seemed to be embedded with crystals. It was as if someone had taken a chrome steel and fused it with a bunch of crushed up mica. He closed his eyes for a moment. I thought not. This is known as arcanite. It's a very, very rare type of material. Once, long ago, the techniques for forging it were as widespread as its many uses. Uses? Like what? Arcanite is incredibly strong. I doubt even you would be able to scratch it. 
Once it has completely cooled off from its forging, it will retain its shape indefinitely. It will never break. It will never dull. But that isn't what sets it apart. No. It is the only known material in Equestria that is resistant to magic. Resistant to magic? That explained why he wasn't able to pick it up earlier with his telekinesis. This is a very, very dangerous artifact that you've stumbled across. Do you realize the things one could do with this? I shook my head again. As far as I was concerned, it was just a weapon. Weapons are only made for one thing. Tithus sighed and leaned back in his chair. That is a surprising relief, Echo. I'm not one for getting creative with items of warfare. You didn't seem to have a problem of getting creative on my gate, he dryly remarked. I used my claws. They are different. They are made for tunneling through rock. They're like your horn. I'm sure you have fewer reservations about using it than things specifically made for destruction. He paused before slowly nodding. That's true. We lapsed into silence for a few moments. Tithus was focusing intently on the blade. I became fixated on a particularly blank area of wall behind his head. Where, uh, where did you find this exactly? He finally said. In the Green Claw Den. It was the spear of the old Alpha, or so I'm told. The haft rotted away, though. Typhus said nothing in reply. Instead, he spun his chair around and hopped off. The captain strode over to his cot and reached under it. He pulled. Oh. 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 He pulled out um, a long trunk out from beneath and magically lifted it onto the desk facing him. The latches flicked open simultaneously. The lid opened. From my view, I couldn't see what was inside, because, uh, but it was obviously some sentiment of some sentimental value to him. The captain rummaged around in the locker for a few moments. I heard the sound of clinks and clanks of small metal objects, the jingling of coins and the rustling of papers. Finally, he seemed to find what he was looking for. With the flick of his head, a long, dark staff floated out from the bottom. Once this was out, he quickly put the trunk away back under his cot, before turning and levitating the staff above his desk. Are you familiar with zebra culture by any chance? he asked me. I hesitated for a moment before drawing on my knowledge from the show. I knew very little about zebras as a whole. Judging an entire race off a few examples was an error I wasn't about to make, seeing as it had been done to me several times now. Not much. They're fascinating, really. Instead of controlling nature as we ponies do, they live with its given conditions. One might say that zebras are more at harmony with nature than equestrians. He chuckled. When I was still a young guard, I was sent on a mission to their lands as an escort to a diplomat, some canterlot upper crust by the name of Lord Fancy Pants. I learned a lot there. Experiencing a new culture, it's eye-opening. Dude, you're preaching to the choir. I befriended a particular zebra mare while I was there. She was a shaman, a practitioner of the mystical arts and such. Oftentimes, she would spend long hours meditating, perched upside down atop this staff, of all things. When I left to return home, she gave me this to remember her by. That was almost twenty years ago, and it hasn't faded or worn, or even crackled. Zebra magic is strange indeed. He faded away, getting a faraway look in his eye. Were you and her... you know... I made fists and bumped them together. <laughs> he cocked an eyebrow. That's none of your business. <laughs> the slightest of smirks on his face told me everything I needed to know. <laughs> he raised the staff up higher, pointing one end toward me. I took hold of it, and he released its grip. It was warm to the touch, made of dark, dried wood. Faint symbols covered the entire length, which was straight as an arrow. A strip of faded cloth was tied to one end, like a ragged pennant. What does this have to do with the spearhead? You said the haft was broken. Here's a new one. I looked down at the medicine staff. It would be wrong to convert such a thing into a weapon of war. I looked back at him and shook my head. I'd rather not. Why are you giving something like this to me anyway? Typhus snorted in amusement. If there was any lesson I learned out in the savannah, it was that one always should have a choice. The spearhead will permi only permit one thing. That what it was made for. The staff is capable of many other things. Perhaps greater, but it cannot take a life. Zebra magic prevents it from doing so. But when you combine the two... I smiled. You have the ability to choose. I like that. Exactly. You're gonna need more than your claws tonight. 
Lives will be lost because of that. But this is what must happen. Okay, I don't like that. I know. Which is why I'm not asking you to accept this. I'm ordering you. With that, the captain picked up the spearhead with both hooves and stuck the back end of the tip onto the stave. His horn lit up with a harsh golden light and the staff warped. The end of the arcanite was sucked into the wood and the wood around the burrowing material tightly bound itself around. Tithus exhaled and pulled back. My hands was the com in my hands was the completed weapon, about my height. The leaf blade looked surprisingly natural alongside the tattooed pole. It glinted in sunlight. I frowned at this. It looks good with you, said the captain. Appreciate this gift, Echo. Sometimes we have to do unpleasant things to ensure the safety of others. You can give gifts back, I moodily replied. Tithus shook his head and made the motions to dismiss me. As I turned to go, however, I paused at the doorway. Zer, <laughs> Zer, Sir, that zebra you knew, what was her name? What happened to her? Her name was Zakora. He said it like he was sipping a fine wine, rolling it off his tongue with the utmost reverence. I don't know what happened to her. We parted ways long ago. If you wish to see her again, um, she lives near Ponyville, on the outskirts of the Everfree Forest. His eye w eyes went wide, the first significant expression of emotion that he'd made this entire time. How do you know that? Internet. With that, I left him open-mouthed, then blinking in shock. How do you spell internet with a question? Whatever. I gave an evil smirk to no pony in particular, slipping the spear into the straps that ran across my back, holding it in place over my left shoulder. With nothing left keeping me, I decided to head outside. There were precious few hours left until the battle, and I intended to enjoy them. Ooh! End of chapter whatchamacallit. <laughs> that was good. Internet. <gasps> yeah, sure, the next one. Right after I look at this ad here, because there's an ad on Fim Fiction, and it has ponies, but it also has Ubisoft. So I'm just going to take a gander at that.